All right, morning, Peter. Good morning, Peter. It's great to be here. It's great to see you. Um, so, Danny has put the pressure on here. He <laughs> said this is going to be the favorite interview of <laughs> mine. That I'm going to do this whole run of shows we do. We're doing like 20, 22 interviews. He's like, Peter St. Ange, that is the one. Oh, it's the going to be your favorite. On. Every okay. trip, I try and pick one. <laughs> and this is the one for this trip. Yeah, he was like, you just wait. He said, you don't even need this. <laughs> you don't need notes. You don't need questions. Um, and also, Ben, who is our, and one of our engineers, producers, works on the show. So he says, you are the person that sound money pilled him. Wow. Okay. That's an honor. Awesome. So, so you arrived today with a lot of pressure. Yeah. Yeah, really. I know. <laughs> All right. So. Can you please give me your background? Tell all the listeners about you, who you are. Uh, so I am a PhD economist. I started my career in marketing, and but I'd studied econ in school. So there was a recession in Canada at the time, so I basically took what I could get. So I took a marketing job. My mom was really disappointed. She was like, you're an economist. What are you working in this? And what I found was that the models of human behavior and marketing are completely different than they are in econ, right? So in mainstream economics, you've got these really clean models where humans are kind of robot. They you know, respond perfectly to incentives. And then on the other hand, in marketing, you've got a completely different like psychological model of how humans behave. And the funny part is that on the one hand, you know, the economists look down on the marketers because they, you know, you guys don't have any theory here. You know, this is just all kind of just so stories. But the thing is that the marketing is the stuff that actually works, right? So bad ideas in marketing fade away because they don't pay the bills, right? So you've got this like weird clash where on paper, econ is just this beautiful edifice that is nearly perfect. But it does not actually work. Like people who actually sell things and actually try to influence human behavior do not pay attention to academic marketing. So I thought that was pretty weird. Uh, and then, you know, the, the dot com thing came in around that time. And so I put, you know, I was single, I had a good salary, I didn't have anything to do with the money. And so I think this is similar to your origin mm. story. So I put everything I had into Amazon options and just rode that puppy. And so I retired at 25 and, you know, goofed around, backpacked in Asia and whatnot. And that gets old after a while. And so at that point I thought, well, I should probably do something useful with life. Uh, and I came back to that, you know, sort of clash between marketing and economics. So I went back, I found a school that I'd come across uh, Rothbard and Mises in the meantime, right? And Austrian economics for me really kind of connected those two, right? So it is a model of human behavior that is based on a very, very small number of assumptions about how humans behave that are, you know, very logical. Uh, humans have goals, uh, you know, they have limitations, they're different from each other. I mean, a very, very small number of premises that are, uh, in Austrian you say apodictically, but that are you know, true. And then from that, you can derive the entirety of economics. So rather than the sort of mainstream with, you know, these giant equations and uh, this quote unquote science that is apparently useless, um, you actually have this sort of from the ground, from human nature, you can derive the entirety of economics. So for me, that was, I mean, that, that was just mind blowing. So, you know, when I was at a loose end and wanted to find something to do with life that was useful, I thought, all right, let me go explore that. So let me look at that nexus, uh, sort of, <laughs> in a way, fix economics and bring in the insights that we actually know from the real world, uh, the kind of stuff that I discovered in marketing. Yeah, there's a lot of parallels with our backgrounds there. Yes, yeah, yeah. there are. I mean, I didn't retire at 25, <laughs> right. and I don't have a PhD. <laughs> I'm not that smart, but but I, I do have a background in marketing. Yes. And you're right, it does work. And the fantastic thing about, I worked in digital marketing, is that you could measure everything. Yes, exactly. So, and you could test, and did right. it work, didn't it work, try something else. And it could be anything from the color of a button to... Uh, the copy for a headline, yep. um, the subject line of an email, you would test all these things and what would work and what wouldn't work. Right. But you would have actionable results that you constantly use to evolve the campaigns. 
And you have never referenced an economics textbook in your marketing. I'm, I'm going to bet, right? <laughs> never, <laughs> never, ever. My, my, um, my favorite, there was a few books. When people used to come and work for my agency, we used to buy them three books. Yeah. Um, Ogilvy on advertising yep. was it's just a phenomenal book uh, about the, the basics of advertising. And, but my favorite book I used to buy everyone was a book called Don't Make Me Think. Uh -huh. I've talked about it on the show before. It's by a guy called Steve Krug. Because I was a planner, and with planner, you have to think about UX and design. Yes. And it, yeah, he had a very simple approach to digital marketing is every time you make me think that is a friction point. Yes. And right. that's actually that's actually framed how we built this podcast. Yeah. So my my entire approach is if somebody says something that I don't fully understand, it's explain that to me. And that, look, there are times I understand, but I know other people won't understand. <laughs> right, exactly. So I'm explain that so to me. So you're speaking for them. Yeah, but that was the most important book uh, I read, and I encourage anyone to read it. But the really interesting thing you said there is we, we, we existed in this Keynesian economics world. Right. And uh, I studied economics at A-level, so high school. Um, studied Keynesian economics never from a position of a teacher saying we should question everything. Let's critically right. think this through. It's, this is the model of economics for the world. It, it has come down from heaven. Yeah, right. This, this, yeah. But what's really interesting from what you've just said there, when you discuss the human incentives, it feels like, correct me if I'm wrong, but Keynesian economics is a school of economics which is trying to, uh, trying to influence outcomes, whereas... Uh, Austrian economics is trying to manage in inputs. Yeah, and I think Austrian starts with the assumption that the goal of economics is to um, is for people to be happy. So people are going to behave in a way uh, that it, that they perceive to be in their best interest. Sometimes they make mistakes. There's all kinds of details to that. Um, but you know, sort of the starting assumption in Austrian is uh, economics is a tool for happiness, sort of like in psychology. Right? So we assume in psychology that the purpose of this field is that we want individuals to be happy. The purpose of the field is not to turn people into some moldable clay for some further objective, you know, like reaching the utopian society or whatever. And I think that that is where Keynesian economics um, was essentially captured. Right? So every conclusion in Keynesian economics the punchline is, so we must give more money or more power to either government or to organizations that are allied with and sponsor government. And any power or money that you're giving to that elite, let's say, uh, is it's, it's coming out of somebody else, right? So to me, Keynesian economics is, I mean, it's, it's almost a purpose-built pro-elite um, project and then, quote unquote, economics is sort of bastardized into a tool to reach those objectives. All right. So there, there are two very different goals there, right? One is let's make people happy. The other one is let's turn people into fodder, you know, into clay to mold into whatever the utopian society that we're aiming at. Does fairness come into this in that Keynesian economics, we have centralized bodies making very important decisions for the economy, right. knowing there's collateral damage. Right. So changes to interest rates, et cetera, certain policy, uh, certain policies, they know that will lead to certain industri industries or sectors, um, perhaps declining, the loss of jobs, but it's for the net, quote unquote, net good of the society, but, right. it, but, but there's this collateral, collateral damage, whereas I feel like Austrian economics is more about the individual they know the rules and it's up to them to be able to you know, build an outcome for them that's fair within that. Exactly, right. And it, it, to be clear, most of the people who are acting in the Keynesian system, I think, are very decent people. Uh, you know, I don't think Jay Powell or Janet Yellen are evil people. They, once you have this system, you must necessarily trade off. Right, you must harm some so that others are benefited. That's that's the nature of central planning. It's it's built into the system, uh, and so you know the the Keynesian system necessarily. Once you've built it that way, it is going to sort of look down from on high, and it's going to weigh everybody. 
And you might hope that it weighs everybody uh, equally or that, you know, it, it's taking care of everybody. But uh, in fact, I mean, it is necessarily a political process. And, you know, there are going to be different interest groups that come in and it's going to end up being um, sort of perverse. Uh, it's not necessarily going to do what people think. To give an example, Keynesian economics tends to favor Wall Street. And, you know, Fancy Wall that. Street, yeah, exactly. And Wall Street does not pull well among the American public. I suspect it doesn't among the British public. It is one of the, uh, you know, it's right behind cholera on like opinion polls. <laughs> and so it's odd, like, why do we have this system that is so, you know, that treats uh, Wall Street so well? Uh, and, you know, the reason is that once you design things on paper, even, even if you had perfect central planners who received it directly from Moses and it was, yes, it's the perfect system, it is going to be corrupted. You know, this is the it's a model by a guy named Bruce Yandel uh, called Bootleggers and Baptists. And he talks about how policy is created. You, you may have heard of the model. Uh, but the general idea is that you have sort of an activist movement. Okay, so they might... In the example he's giving, um, these might be Baptists who think that it's terrible that you can sell alcohol on Sunday. Okay, so they might come in and say, you know, this is the demon rum, look at all this social trouble, and so we need to ban alcohol on Sunday. The thing is that the bootleggers, the people who are selling illegal alcohol, they will tend to agree very strongly with that point of view. They will come in, they have the resources where they can buy an audience with politicians. So the activists are going to be the ones who generate the social momentum for whatever, whatever intervention the government's going to engage in. But the interested parties are going to be the ones who are actually going to write the legislation. They're going to write the updates. Once you've got the power to write laws, you're going to do all kinds of fun stuff. You're going to outlaw the competition. Uh, it, you know, you're going to engage in the kinds of things that we see from Wall Street. You're going to end up bending government to give you special privileges. And so, you know, if we look at taking sort of the Wall Street example, you know, there were a number of panics in U.S. history that led to genuine, you know, you had uh, farms being repossessed and you had companies going, solid companies going out of business, you know, all these terrible things. And so you had this sort of activist movement for some kind of reform. And at that point, you know, uh, politicians responded and the special interests got involved. And then the end result is that we get this system today where I think many of us look around and we say, how on earth in democracies, how did we get this system that is so anti-democratic, right? The system that benefits the elites so much at the expense of the masses who in theory are the sovereigns of our democracies. And how? <laughs> how did we? I mean, how did how did that, that, Keynesian economics win this race? And yeah, and a question I've often asked is why has Austrian economics always been this niche underground yeah. study right. of economics? Because we are disfavored. We don't get the money. Um, is the short story. So if you go back through economic history and you sort of trace through the evolution, so going through the 1400s, 1500s, you had the Spanish scholastics, you had all these. Um, interesting innovations. And one by one, they were sort of discovering the pieces of modern economics. That goes straight into what we now call Austrian economics. In other words, Austrian economics is normal economics. Okay. It is the evolution. Uh, you had this mutation <laughs> branch off right around the progressive era. The big innovation in the progressive era, so this is starting around 1890s to 19. Uh, basically until World War I is when they were victorious, uh, and really all across the West. And the great innovation of the progressives was uh, capturing huge swaths of society's resources and putting them at the disposal of the government. Uh, that was really um, the genius, that was the purpose of the movement. You know, if we look at both the British and the American economy before the progressive era, so this would be the late uh, Victorian era, uh, it, it was extraordinarily free, uh, it was very, very easy to start a business. Uh, if you ran into trouble in life, if you got fired, for example, your reaction, you know, there, there was no, there were government benefits, but they were uh, not very generous. And so your first reaction would be to go start a business. Right? I mean, it was, it was just a completely different world than we have today. The levels of innovation were much, much higher. Uh, almost everything that we think of today as high tech, like if you take everything that Elon Musk uh, builds, <laughs> All of it was invented in a very short period between about 1870 and 1890. Like essentially we are running on the fumes 
of inventors from 100 years ago. And I think the reason is because of that progressive revolution. They had a very um, specific strategy to capture uh, certain parts of government, and then they could sort of leverage that into shifting resources over towards their movement. And so a big part of that movement, they were aware that economics was a um, determinant of public opinion. And so they were very interested in capturing the field of economics. And within that sort of Keynesian, you know, Keynes was their figurehead, but really the movement predated Keynes. He was useful for them. Uh, and the goal was what had traditionally been called inflationism, which basically, I mean, that, that that's just describing the idea that the government can, um, there's various ways that it can take resources. One of them, of course, that it can just print it um, via fiat. But anyway, at the culmination of this process, you had this sort of capture of economics by this mutant sort of pro-government brand of economics. And so the, the sort of remnant of economics, the remnant economists, they got gradually forced out of the universities. They didn't get the funding. Uh, economic funding today is overwhelmingly comes from governments. Um, you know, there are tens of thousands uh, of, of PhDs in the US. Almost every monetary economist in the US takes money from the Federal Reserve. I, there is no chance that I will get any money from the Federal Reserve, right? So, <laughs> you know, I have to have a day job. Um, so really the funding can determine the direction of the field. And as a result, you know, when you sort of survey the economic landscape, it looks like, Aus quote unquote, Austrians are remnants. And I would argue that we, we are the, we are the heirs to the 500 year evolution of, ec of economics, Keynes is it doesn't really deserve to be called economics. It's just, uh, it's a government department. You sound like a conspiracy theorist. <laughs> what is this crazy talk? The track record for conspiracies the past couple of years has been pretty good, so. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, look, it's fascinating, and I, I have, uh, we've just talked about it in the previous interview, I have this ever-growing distrust and dislike of the education system. Mm -hmm. um, my son is out of it now. My daughter's still in it. I know I, when I was taught economics, it was Keynes. Right. I know I was taught a completely false model of economics, yes. which benefits government and not me as an individual. I, I know I was lied to. Right. Um, and I don't believe my teachers... Uh, felt they were lying to us. I felt absolutely like, right. I felt like they thought this is the model for economics, yes. but I dislike the fact that I didn't know there were multiple models of economics. I dislike the right. fact that I wasn't. I didn't have Austrian economics raised. I, I dislike the fact that I wasn't given the opportunity to debate, debate, and discuss these things and think through them critically. Right. I don't think we were very often taught to think about things critically. Right. And. Now it puts me in a position whereby I'm rethinking schooling. Yeah. It's frustrating. It really is. And it is, I think it's frustrating for all of us, the degree to which they have captured the institutions that a lot of us trusted. Um, you know, I also agree that teachers who taught me, uh, they seemed like dedicated, decent people. I'm sure that they did not think that they were, you know, propagating propaganda or something. Um, they were decent people, but the the government has been very, very clever uh, at how it's gone about it. Where you know, once you capture education, you you use that to sort of propagate to uh, you know spread the virus. Um, and if you brainwash the teachers, then the teachers are going to go on to brainwash people. Even very, very decent teachers are going to do it because they are not aware what is happening. So it's it's been incredibly clever how they've managed to do it, and unfortunately, uh, you know, it puts people like us in a position where you know we are definitely outside, <laughs> um, uh, trying to sort of shake people out of this sleep and sort of show them all of these contradictions that they see, you know. So allegedly, um, you know, government controls the economy in order to help the little guy, and so let's let's actually look at government interventions <laughs> and look at what they're actually doing. Uh, you know, they say shut the poor out of decent housing. Uh, but on the other hand, they hand trillions of dollars to Wall Street. Uh, they, you know, um, d does, is something wrong here? And, you know, the government's response is always, well, you know, we make mistakes sometimes and, and uh, you know, we're trying to get better. 
Jerome Powell, for example, uh, just last year, he gave a speech. He was he was asked about the whole transitory inflation thing, and he said, "Well, we've we've learned a lot about how little we know about inflation." And you know, th- this is always kind of the and and I mean, he actually said it while half laughing. And I mean, that's super hilarious, Jay, because we have got how many millions of jobs and companies at risk because you screwed this up. Right? We've got banks collapsing now because the Fed told them with. You know, tens of thousands of PhD. The Fed told them, uh, you know, inflation is going to be very transitory here. This is just, you know, we just got the supply chain thing that'll work out. All right. So, because the Fed very confidently said that, the U.S. economy, possibly the world economy, is crashing. But this is all very funny to him. And you know, what's what's screwed up about that system is that what should be happening when they fail is that there should be some basic questions being asked here. Right, like, are you guys competent to be wielding the power that you have? Right, is this the ring where nobody can possess this? Right, because not only you, you know, Jerome Powell may be pure of heart, but not everybody in that process of pure of heart. And even if they were, you do not have the information. You have tens of thousands of the world's best PhD, the best PhDs money can buy, that you have working on this pro- program, and yet you come out with garbage predictions. So it, it is it is both a corrupt process and it is an impossible process. And we've known this for a long time. This is why a lot of people don't like central planning. Central planning does not work. Even if it is by angels, it is impossible to know. And so the alternative is get out of the running the world business and let the people manage their own affairs. And you know, if we go back to that Victorian uh, golden age, It's actually, it's called the Gilded Age in the U.S. because socialist journalists renamed the Golden Age. Uh, If we go back to that period, we had much more individual sovereignty, right? Individuals decided how to educate their kids. Um, You know, they decided what kind of, uh, how to manage their financial life, what kind of business to build. If we take just education for an example, right, if we sort of contrast that people-powered world versus government-powered world, I did a study where I looked at inaugural speeches of each president, right? So each president's every four years, and they give these inaugural speeches, and they promise all the wonderful things they're going to do. What's fun about that is that it gives you kind of a standardized, you know, sample that you can compare one to the next. And then I did the flesh Kincaid score, the grade level scoring, okay, of each speech. And so what you're trying to find out here is how stupid do the speech writers think the American people are, right? So this is an indirect measure of how the education system is doing, right? Presumably the people who write presidential inauguration speeches are probably the top marketers in politics, okay? They know what they're doing. They are not talking to grade 12 when they should be talking to grade eight. They know exactly what they're doing. So if you go through those speeches, you go back to 1900 when people had still been educated in that golden age and you've got grade levels of like 12, 13, 14 in modern terms. Right, so that is high school graduates, first year, second year college. That is what they thought the median voter, in other words, the median American was. You go to today, <laughs> so I think uh, this is from memory, but it, it had gone down, down, down as public schooling increased. By Barack Obama, it was like eighth grade. By Donald Trump, it was seventh grade. By Joe Biden, it was fourth grade. So unless marketers have gotten so bad now that they do not know who they're talking to, which I don't think is true, I think those are accurate measures. I mean, we've seen it in the UK. I posted a vid- video up of uh, Rishi Sunak. Um, he was in the, at the back of a car talking to a phone, you know, giving a speech, you know, talking to the electorate. And I said, I feel like he's talking to a kindergarten. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was so bad. It was condescending. Yeah. And normal people read political speeches from 100 years ago. And I, I mean, the rhetoric is just astounding. Yeah. It, it, they all sound like works of art to us today yeah. because we are starved for any kind of intellectual. <laughs> but it's a lack of backbone in politicians these days as well. And yeah. it's, yeah, and again, it's probably just another system of bad incentives, but yeah, we're a couple of years away from a general election here in the U.S. Um, we're fully expecting a, 
a Biden v Trump war, but you never know. Um, and there's some interesting people coming out and saying some interesting things. You see yeah. DeSantos very critical of CBDCs. Yeah. So yeah, forget the rest of his politics. You're on my side on that topic. We see uh, RFK coming out talking about Bitcoin. Yeah. You're like, okay, you're with me on that topic. Right. Vivek Ramaswamy, he's been talking about sound money. So look, they, these people see the problem. You know, they're speaking in our language. When they get elected, what happens? Do they go in and get sucked into this model of bad incentives or will they change things? I suspect they get sucked into this model of bad incentives. They can't get things done. It's almost like um, the selfish gene. Yeah. The selfish gene takes over. It's like, are these people, you know, is it particular malice or is it just the selfish gene is how we get things done? I, I don't know. Yeah. You know, we saw an example with Trump. So Trump was pretty lousy on sound money. Yeah. I mean, he was just like any other standard politician uh, as far as money went. But on a lot of other issues, whether or not you agree with him, he was trying to change a lot of things. Yeah. And it is incredible the kinds of walls that he ran into. Uh, and so, you know, if we actually do get somebody in there who believes in sound money, I imagine the walls that are built around money are even stronger than what's built around things like education or other, you know, power centers of the elite. Uh, so, I mean, honestly, you know, if we look back through history, the times when soft money flips too hard, it is not an evolutionary process. Uh, it, it takes a crisis that wakes people up, that gets them so pissed off at the system. You know, basically a fall of the Soviet Union type situation where you get this, it's called a preference cascade, where um, like Monday, everybody is a Marxist, maybe not a super enthusiastic Marxist, but yeah, sure, everybody's a Marxist. And then Tuesday, nobody was ever a Marxist ever in their life, right? Like, in, in other words, the system fails so catastrophically and so obviously Unfortunately, those failures take a lot of people down with them, mm -hmm. right? There's a lot of collateral damage. When a monetary system fails and you get hyperinflation, then a lot of people go down with it. And so I think people like you and I have two options. Uh, one of them is to remind the frog that the water is getting quite hot. You know, some, sometimes people get upset at me, you know, they're, uh, they're like, why do you always talk about bad things? Why don't you talk about good things? And I'm like, the, because I want the frog to understand the water is getting hot before it actually boils, right? I want the people to understand the crap that's being done to them before it actually starts to destroy their lives. Mm. And, and of course, the second thing we can do is the lifeboat. Right. So try to rescue as many people as possible. You know, even if we take worst case scenarios like Weimar Germany, uh, a lot of people did come out of that in one piece because they questioned the government in time. And for me, that's really key is to break this almost spell that people have where, you know, in their mind, they imagine that anytime the government says it, well, this is an official statement. You know, this is this is the official truth. And I think that's historically extraordinarily dangerous. And so to the extent that I can at least get people to question it, they may not jump into the lifeboat yet, whether that's gold or Bitcoin, but at least to get them aware that maybe they're going to have to do that sometime so that when things do start to crash, they can get out in time. And I think there's a lot of evidence out there right now. People are definitely starting to question things. I yes. see in the UK, yep. we've had high inflation, we've got high debt. You know, we've had attack on public services. That's going to continue. Yep. You know, still, we're, we're still in the cycle. It doesn't, the change of uh, leadership when uh, Labour will win the next election, because they will, because Conservatives are so disliked right now. None of this is going to change. They're facing the same economic problems. They will have the same solutions. Right. And so I know people are questioning it now. That they question it, and they've been shown the lifeboat, but, you know, the Titanic hasn't split yet. That's exactly it. It might still flow. The music is still playing. Yeah. Right. yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> it, it's, it's a really interesting time. I feel very fortunate to have been able to spend a lot of time with a lot of very smart people and explain this to me and open my eyes to it. But I really struggle to get people to see that. And I think this is why you're, you're right here. It, it will come from catastrophe. Yeah. Sadly, something way worse than what we saw in 2008. I think it will. If, if we're looking at the numbers now, you know we are looking at a bank crisis on 2008 scale combined with an inflation crisis on 1970 scale, 
and with an additional piece of debt crisis, you know, in, in, uh, so in other words, in 2008, you didn't have terrible inflation. Okay. In 1970, you didn't have terrible debt. It, it's like, it just keeps piling on and on. So in, you know, today in the U S we're looking at between a hundred percent or we're over well over a hundred percent of GDP in, uh, just federal debt. And then of course the system, is just shot through with debt, uh, all over 2008 accelerated that massively. In fact, that's, that's basically their modern, uh, response to any sort of crisis is just to pile on more and more debt. And so in a sense, it's, it's, you know, building the Jenga tower higher and higher, uh, and increasing the risks. And so if we look at that process and we compare it to the last two crises in living memory, 2008 and uh, 1970s, then it, it really does feel like we've got all three of them combined. The only thing we're missing is the meteor strike. <laughs> yeah, I hadn't put that one on my uh, bingo card. <laughs> well, we might get one out of, uh, we don't necessarily have to get into that, but there are various kinetic events occurring in the world that may give us that one. So. Look over here. <laughs> don't look here. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. Okay. Okay. Well, I also, um, what is interesting is we have this technology, Bitcoin, and we'll get into Bitcoin versus gold. Um and I know you're a fellow at Mises. Yes. But was it Mises who said the quote, we'll have to wrestle it from their hands? We'll have to wrestle... Hayek, yeah. Oh, was it right. Hayek? Hayek, yeah. he said we have to wrestle the money from their hands. Yeah, he said... Uh, a sneaky we, way or something. Right. We can't take them on head to head. And so we have to um, capture the money in a sly, roundabout way. Yeah. That he, they don't necessarily detect. And so that is kind of Bitcoin in a sentence, Yeah, yeah. Um, what does it mean to be a fellow at Mises? That I've been asked that. Um, apparently, fellow in general in academia is like a really elastic term. It just kind of means you hang out together. Um, so sometimes you get paid. I don't get paid for Mises. Um, sometimes you don't, but it just means you're associated. So uh, you know, I give talks and uh, write articles and and such at Mises. I, sh I, sh I should spend more time on that website. You should be a fellow at Mises. Apparently, they get out. I mean, I, I don't know if I, I think, I think I'd weird people out if I was a fellow at Mises. Um, so you've traveled a lot. You yeah. mentioned you were you know, retired at 25. Amazing. You traveled a lot. What similarities and differences have you seen around the world on your travels? Because you've obviously, you must have been observing the different economic systems. Yeah, I think, so I have spent a lot of time in specifically Latin America and in East Asia. Those are probably my two most um, favorite regions. And I like those both culturally and uh, politically, well, politically a lot more East Asia, but kind of going through each. Um, you know, what I really like about Latin America is that you have, you can sort of go back in time in a way. Uh, families are much, much stronger. Um, people rely on their families. They keep in touch with their families, uh, even though families are shrinking, right? Like modern Latin Americans have, you know, two, three kids. Uh, it, it's not like the stereotype. Um, but even so, people are very, very close. They're close to their extended families. They're close with the people they grew up with, the people they went to school with. Like there's, there's this social cohesion that I think is missing in, um, Normally, I guess I'd say the West, uh, the the U.S. and and Western Europe. Um, but anyway, I feel like it's really missing there. Uh, you know, people don't get married as much. They don't necessarily form traditional families. I think there's a certain amount of um, instability that you get from that. Um, and I understand why we got there. I you know came from a broken household as well. But I, I sort of like the idea of a society where people are. Um, not looking, you know, they're not sort of atoms flying across, um, you know, as if we're like at an airport bar, just sort of bumping into each other, chit-chatting and then never seeing each other again, right? But like rather that there's a stability. I think you do get that maybe in rural areas, maybe, maybe even in England, um, but certainly in the U.S. where, you know, people are much more stable. Uh, but that is something I like about Latin America. The political system in Latin America, I think, is is horrific, broadly mm. speaking. It's it's even more corrupt um, than it is in the U.S. and Europe. Of course, there are exceptions, such as uh, the current president of El Salvador, uh, but broadly speaking. East Asia, for me— But even that's questioned. Yeah, 
For sure. I mean, uh, always. There's so much corruption throughout, I think, the systems in Latin America that even if you've got a couple people who are clean, it is very, very hard uh, to stay away from it. I don't think Bukele's corrupt. He has followed a succession of corrupt presidents. For sure. Uh, the main question with regards to him is due process, strength of institutions. And, right. Uh, we had an interview the other day where we you know, questioned the trade-offs between you know, Perhaps this is a revolution led by one, and right. will he rebuild the strength of the institutions? Maybe that's what he needs to do rather than a revolution of the people. He's very popular. Yeah. Um, there are questions, but I think that's one we'll see play out. It'll play out like every other dictator, whereby he will stay on too long and have to uh, control the media to, to wield his power, or you know, he's a benevolent dictator who does right. a fantastic job and changes the fortunes of that country and rebuilds the institutions. It's, a, it's an interesting case study. It, 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 yeah, it really is. And, you, you know, if we go back historically, um, I'm sure you've come across the uh, Hans Hermann Hoppe, the sort of monarchy model, right? And so that that's sort of the question is, uh, dic most dictators are bad, but every so often you do have dictators um, who act like monarchs where they do actually care about the country, they treat the country, uh, you know, as their own family. Um, but unfortunately, it's rare, and typically the longer they stay around, um, the worse they get. But the, uh, to your earlier question, the other area that I wanted to pitch, the place that I've really spent the biggest chunk of my life has been East Asia. So specifically, I was a professor over in Taiwan, uh, and I spent a number of years in Japan. And both of those, for me, have been really important because they, in many ways, I think they, they kind of show the way. Uh, they're encouraging that that old world is not dead. Um, you do have those kinds of traditions that you have in Latin America, but then on top of that, you have astoundingly competent governments. It, it's very hard to be uh, an anarcho-capitalist in Taiwan because everything works. I mean, it's... Yeah, I've been to Taiwan. It's amazing. It, it's, right? It's amazing. Yes. I, and, and I fear... Uh, a uh, a Chinese invasion and takeover and destroy. <laughs> know, yeah. What a brilliant place, a brilliant country. Yeah. Good place to do business. Well, I keep hoping maybe China's provinces will secede and join Taiwan and then <laughs> I, world peace once again. I'm not confident of that. <laughs> uh, have you been to Taiwan? Uh, no, I it's haven't flown through it. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. Um, I've I, I been to Japan as well. Uh, also a very interesting place. I, th I also, what I find in found in both Japan and Taiwan is very respectful places. Yes. There's a real class to the way people are. Right. So if that was your experience. And what's what's funny, and, and, and of course, economically, it's, I mean, they're also wonderful, right? You have low tax rates. It's very, very easy, easy to start a business. Uh, I had a friend who started a an English school, as one does. Uh, and he, after about a year of operating, the local tax lady came in and she had the local police uh, you know, sergeant sitting with her. And they came in for tea. And she said, so we know that you've been running this business and you haven't been paying any taxes, but you're a small business and that's completely understandable. But at this point, we estimate based on the traffic that you're probably making about this much. And so we would, you know, hope that you pay, you know, roughly this amount of taxes. That's, that's what we would sort of imagine might happen. Um, but the policeman was there to communicate that it's fine. Right. You're a startup. Life is hard for a startup. We completely understand how it, how it is. But now that we can see that your business is doing really well, you do have to do your share, was the you know, signal. And that is so in contrast to what one gets in the US, or I, I imagine Britain, where it, it's almost like it's a war between the regulators and the small businesses. Like, can we find a way to shut you down? It's like if you go to the DMV, you know, and you're going to renew your, and they're like, let me see if I can find some form that you don't have. And, you know, as soon as they, ha you must go home and get this form, they have defeated you. I mean, I have multiple businesses. It's so hard. <sighs> it's incredible. I mean, the range of things, like uh, my most recent one, I bought a bar. Yes. A yeah. bar, it's open twice a week. Yeah. Really. Um, my first difficulty was taking over the bank account from the people who had it. I, I spent six weeks with the bank <laughs> trying to get it transferred into my name, signing the mandates, taking identity of them, KYC checks, uh, all the uh, registration documents. And 
uh, a combination of their poor systems and me just being unable to get them to confirm my documents. In the end, I have to give up. I, I said to them, I'm going to another bank now. I'm going to a, a neo bank, yeah. which I created in a day because you cannot transfer the account to me. It's astounding. The licenses we have to have. The, you know, if I want to do anything within the property, which is a fixed structure, I have to submit a planning application. So one example is we have a garden and we may want to have a bar in there. If the bar is mobile, it's fine. But if it's a fixed structure, I have to have the I have to go get planning permission and get approval to do that. I mean, I could tell you endless stories, all the different licenses I have to pay for. It's just endless difficulty doing business. Yeah, you know, it's setting up businesses, it's operating businesses, it's getting banking, it is licenses, it's and then there's all the taxes we pay. I'm a I'm amazed how many businesses are so operational, yeah. but I'm also frustrated because I think how many businesses could start and exist and be operational that aren't because it's just too hard. Yeah, and um, you saw uh, Jeremy Clarkson's recent right, like yeah. the 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 on his farm show, and I mean the entire theme of it was just him going to battle. And this is a guy with significant resources and you know a significant voice. Mm-hmm. So how is it for normal people? They are absolutely crushed. And that brings us back to the Keynesian thing. Where you know the 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 purpose of the Keynesian system is not to crush small businesses for sure. You know nobody who designed that thought that what that's what would happen. But when you concentrate all of these resources into the bureaucracy, the bureaucrats have to find something to do. Uh, you know, and oh well, they'll check licenses, right? <laughs> and, and so nowhere in there, you know, figures the actual experience of the entrepreneur who is on the business end of all of this, really it's just make work to justify budgets, but in the process, you then become sort of the product that gets victimized by this. And, and the bureaucracy always grows. For sure. Right, absolutely. And, and you know, the, one of the iconic studies of that was uh, actually from Britain. They were looking at, as colonies gained independence, uh, so and then the um, budgetary needs of the, what was it, the Commonwealth and whatever it was, the, the agency that administered the colonies. And as the number of colonies reduced, the headcount actually grew. It's quite strange, because you think, well, you don't have as many colonies, perhaps you don't need as many staff anymore. But no, 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 it was the contrary. Yeah, I mean, look, I find it so frustrating, and especially when I look at taxation. When you look at taxation as a business owner, you create a business, and you employ people, and every month, you pay a tax on those employees. You pay their... Yeah, you pay their um, income tax for them, which is their right. tax, but you have to pay a national insurance, so the right. company has to pay that. And at the end of the year, I have to then pay a corporation tax. And then from that, I pay myself either a dividend or you know, wages, but they've closed the loophole on dividends v. wages, so essentially, I still pay the same tax. And with that money I get, I then... Uh, um, buy things where I pay a tax on them, whether that is fuel tax, whether it's VAT on products. It's a continual rent-seek and all the hard work that I and the team I have done. And I mean, I don't know how much I end up giving to the government, but I feel like in the end, it's, you know, it's 70% maybe. Yeah. It may be higher. Yeah. And the f- most frustrating thing about this, I'm not anti-tax. I think there are things that governments can do and will help. I'm not anti-tax. But what became really obvious is that this podcast we do over the last five years, over the, over the last year is where we hit the, uh, you know, really did start to do well. We had a, you know, a good amount of income coming in. Because that income had come in and I had that in my pocket, I could buy this bar. It right. became available. And, you know, maybe in a year I can then open another bar because I have the capital, which means I can then employ people and create jobs right. yep. you know, and pay people. And so this, you know, it, it became more evident when I got free, when I, when I became free from the economic constraints because of the success of the business, it became more evident about what I could, where I could put that money to good work. And so like, I'm not anti-tax, I'm not completely anti-government, but I am anti the size of the bureaucracy and what it's yes. become. Right. And all I care about now is how do we shrink that? It's almost why I've become very sympathetic with the libertarians. I used to think of the libertarians as naive and, you know, your system will never work. What are you on about? You know, you, it's never going to work. My, my sympathy now is that all I care about is shrinking government. 
yeah. shrinking power, shrinking control, shrinking tax. Because I know, I know if you remove the remove these bureaucratic layers and you reduce tax, more people will start businesses and that will lead to more productivity. It's so obvious now. Right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, we were talking earlier about Taiwan. The university I was teaching at was right next to a big night market called Fengjia Night Market in Taichung, one of the biggest uh, in Taiwan. And the way it worked there, there was a certain amount of mafia involvement in the governance. So they would do things like quality control, make sure that you wash your dishes. But because it was a private sector enforcer, you know, I mean, it was it was a very light touch. And I mean, essentially, if you wanted to run a business, you would just go. They had little places where you would rent the you know truck, the little truck on wheels, the little kitchen on wheels. So you would go down there, you would rent that, you would pay a hundred bucks for a guy to do novel signage for you. So you would decide what to name your business and whatnot. You would wheel that over to the market and you would set up shop and then you know you would pay a little bit of rent and that was it, right? There were no licenses, there was no nothing. There was this private sector quality control to make sure that you don't weren't doing anything crazy. Um, but the end result was that you know you had thousands and thousands of people who had these little businesses there. Uh, you did not have to be almost maniacally driven in order to actually start a business, which I mean, you know, today in a place like Britain or the US, if you don't already have like a family business that you're taking over, like if you are out of the blue deciding to start manufacturing something in Britain, you've got to, I mean, there's got to be some special reason you're doing that. Like, you know, maybe because it's inherent to the brand, you've got the flag on it or something. But I mean, like, you know, if you're going to manufacture something normal, you know, pens in Britain, you, you, you've you got to have a screw loose because it is so difficult to do. And, you know, nobody wants that. I mean, no matter how you vote, nobody on earth hates small business and wants like, you know, pen factories to, to, uh, to be destroyed in their country. I mean, that's just an insane preference. But the problem is that once you give all of this power to the, whatever you call it, the government machinery, um, it starts doing perverse things. It does things that are in its interests and not necessarily in yours. Now, in theory, the voters could then look at that and they could say, hey, this is terrible. Look how hard it is to start a business. And so they could, call, you know, they would communicate to their politicians. Their politicians would tell the bureaucrats to stop doing that. And I think that it used to do that. Like if we go back to that Victorian or the golden age, I think that government was small enough that there were transmission mechanisms. You know, so if you add, uh, you know, the local MP would hear there, you know, the rest, the, the fish and chip shops in their neighborhood would be upset about something and then they would talk and then it, it, w- it would get resolved really quickly. But today, of course, there, there are these massive layers of bureaucracy. Everything has got to go through. I can't imagine how many layers of bureaucratic approval something has to go through. And the bureaucrats don't even have to necessarily listen to you. You know, they have their own goals in life. Um, Maybe there's some program that has a lot of budget potential in the future, and so it's going to be very good for their bureaucratic um, career. And so they're not particularly interested in what the fish and chip shops needs. This is what I personally need in order to progress the bureaucracy. You get all these perverse incentives in the system. Uh, One expression, uh, this is from uh, Mencius Moldbug, is a self-licking ice cream cone. Like the system exists to serve itself. Mm -hmm. It is no longer serving us the people. And the problem, of course, is that we have to obey that system, right? Like that system is our sovereign. There's no upset. Right. But in theory, of course, we the people are the sovereign. So something is very wrong in this picture here, right? We have this ruling Leviathan that has very, very little input from us. It ignores politicians, you know, for fun. And I mean, I, I, you know, I, I don't have that much respect for politicians, but compared to a ruling Leviathan that does not even care what the people think, I will take politicians any day of the week who are at least somewhat responsive. So it, it starts to look like an occupying army. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, I, a lot of the times I question what should the role of government be? What, right. what do we need government for? Is there fair regulations? When I went up to Wyoming, you know, I met, um, I met a chap called Tyler up there, and he was saying to me, uh, they were trying to get rid of licenses. He said when he took over, you know, if you were hairdressers, you needed the license to be a hairdresser. He said, you shouldn't need a license to be a hairdresser. Right. You should just open and cut people's hair. Yeah. That should be it. Right. But at the same time, I would con- contrast, I was quite a contrast, but I went to uh, an Ai Weiwei exhibition, and uh, one of the um, 
one of the, uh, his displays was from uh, the earthquake in China. There was a certain region where lots of properties collapsed. And the reason they were collapsed because they were badly built. Right. Uh, they didn't follow regulations. And so when the earthquake hit, these buildings collapsed. So he took the metal steel structures and built sculptures out of them. And that, that also flipped, flipped to me to make me realize that actually you know, some of these regulations around buildings are designed to protect people. We had a huge fire in the UK at a... Uh, called Grenfell. It was a block of flats that went up in fire. I think about 85 people died. Right. Again, because the cladding they used around the building wasn't great. So sometimes I think, well, should we, and I know there's people out there who argue, no, the free market will always, always solve these problems. I, I'm not 100% sure. I, I often come down to, if if there are certain mistakes made, it would lead to considerable death. Maybe right. that is something that needs regulation. Is there any room for that in a, in a in a world of sound muddy and Austrian, Austrian economics. Yeah, I mean, if we go back to that Victorian slash golden age, there was some regulation. Um, there was much, much less than there is today. And overwhelmingly, the way that problems like that, you know, basically corporate misbehavior or individual misbehavior, the way that those were dealt with was through the common law system of tort. So if somebody endangered you, then you could bring a lawsuit. Lawsuits were extraordinarily easy to bring. Uh, typically, you would not have to hire a lawyer. You would not have to go through that expense. You would simply go to the magistrate and you would say, hey, this person did this. And the magistrate would send his bailiff around to ask the other person, you know, come and tell your side of the story. And then he would make a decision. It was poof. It was very, very easy. And so you had that tort system worked fantastically. And the goal was that if somebody harmed you, if they were negligent, then they had to compensate you for the harm. And logically, the reason that you're building it that way is that you're saying, you know, so if my business burns down your house, the most economically efficient way to treat that is as if the business burned down his own house. Okay, you want to internalize the costs of any kind of risk into the business itself. And, and, and that's what the tort system does. And so if tort is functioning, you need government to enforce it. Right? So in that scenario, if the magistrate goes to the other guy and he says, well, I, you know, I've decided that you've done something reckless. Let's say you, you, you set a fire in your backyard and, and you ended up burning down the neighbor's house. Uh, so you have to pay them. Well, somebody has to force that other person to actually pay what they owe, right? So I think that you know there are ways to do that in an in an anarchic system where you have you know basically individuals self organize and then they will choose like a village elder and things like that. It's hard to get there from here, yeah. Especially in a world where countries like China exist, who you know guarantee if you have a sovereign island that has no police force out in the Pacific. Somebody's taking that island. In fact, that that actually happened. There was, I think it was in the 1970s, there were a group of hippies who founded the Republic of, uh, uh, God, what was it called? Anyway, Mirvana or something. And literally the neighboring country, I think it was Tuvalu, came by uh, with like four soldiers in a boat with a flag and they showed up. <laughs> It's like, do you have a flag? So they showed up and they, you know, they had the guns and they brandished the guns and they put the flag on. They said, thank you. This is our territory. Okay. So, you know, there are very practical reasons why you can't quite get from where we are now um, to our capitalist. But I think that, you know, when we ask about alternatives to regulation, you, you know, fortunately we have that golden age and we can look at how things were resolved back then. You had very, very small number of regulations. The ones that existed were generally uh, corrupt, such as um, Bank of England, or we didn't have the Fed uh, quite yet, but you did have some corrupt regulations. It was a much, much smaller number. And for the rest of the world, the sort of free market world, you had tort. And yes, government had to enforce tort um, in that kind of scenario, but be but I think we can get there, you know, again, if we look at places like uh, Taiwan, for example, it, there's a certain magic to simply shrinking the government down to a certain level. The government starts to say there are certain things that it cannot enforce. You know, so I grew up in, in Philadelphia and in the 70s, and Philadelphia was kind of a rough town, it still is. And there were certain things that the police did not notice. Um, you know, a lot of business violations that they didn't notice. And why? Well, because their mom went to church with, 
you know, the deli guy's mom, right? It, you know, there were like social connections, why people um, didn't, you know, play the whole thing bureaucratically. And there were also budget issues. So the police were fairly responsive and they wanted to put guys on murders and they didn't want to put them on, you know, is your, you know, whatever, is your deli serving beer without a license? That was not considered to be a, a serious issue. So I think that we can get back to that without necessarily like crushing the whole system and rebuilding on the ashes. Um, rather that simply, you know, A, restricting budgets, B, cutting the power of the bureaucracy so that, you know, we should not have a civil service that is independent of the people. Uh, it should be extraordinarily easy to fire anybody in the government, that would actually fix it in one single go. If the prime minister could waltz in and fire everybody in the British hierarchy, you would have a complete cultural transformation where the entire British government would now work for the politicians. Politicians suck, but they are a lot better than a permanent civil service that is completely independent of the people. Well, I had this conversation with my son recently because I have a growing interest of running for mayor of Bedford. Yes. Yes. Seeing what I've seen, talking to people like you and understanding these problems and you know, knowing my council's budget and seeing where they've spent it. And we're not, we're not, we're by far not the worst, but I said to my son, I said, I think the first thing I'm going to do is really piss a lot of people off because I'm going to just go in and get rid of as many people as I can yes. doing wasteful jobs. Now, that is actually very difficult. It's very difficult to get rid of people in the UK, yeah. it's, which is obviously ludicrous yeah. because you want, you, want, you want people to be able to learn from being got rid of. Right. You know, it's sports. You learn by winning and losing. Well, and, 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 and the mayor is the representative of the people. The people yeah. are sovereign. Yes. And so I, I, I imagine in my little dream fantasy of being mayor yeah. in Bedford, I would, I would walk in first day and I would just go around and find out what everybody does. <laughs> and then I would go away and I'd come back and say, well, I'm getting rid of this department and this department and this department. We're getting rid of this. We're going to change this. I know it's, it's not going to happen because there will be there will power structures and walls that stop me doing that. Absolutely. But that's what I want to do and I want yeah. to do it. Uh, my son rightly said, he said, you won't be able to do that. You just, you won't be able to, but I want to have a go. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that kind of thing could inspire movements across the country. Of course. You know, you see what's happening now with the 15 minute cities and the, the civil disobedience. Uh, I think the people of Britain and the people of the US are ripe for that kind of um, movement that puts more power into the hands of the people. Well, I think it's, there's only so long you can get away with it. We went through boom eras. The 90s were pretty good. The start of the noughties were pretty good. Even the post-2008, there was a recovery. There was. Yeah, we got back to a decent stage. And I, I'm, I'm not so naive to not identify there were winners and losers there. Poverty rates in places like the UK have gone yeah. up, which is shocking. But I think it's ripe for disruption. Yeah. You know, disrupt, disruption is often used in technology to explain new ideas. I think we're ripe for dis disruption now. Maybe Bitcoin is a tool of that. I, actually, I, I want to get into that with you as well. Yes. As, as somebody who studied economics, did your PhD, I, I imagine you did that before Bitcoin arrived? Yes, that was before Bitcoin. And when I first heard about Bitcoin was about 2011. My wife told me to buy which it's usually the other way around, sorry. My wife told me to buy, uh, and I was convinced that the U.S. government would ban it, so I was in that camp. And, uh -oh. you know, they had recently arrested Bernard von Nothaus. I don't know if you remember him. Was that Liberty Reserve? Yeah, Liberty Dollars. Yeah. And he had printed it up in silver, and I think he stamped $1 on the front of it. Okay, and so this was a coin that had like maybe $20 silver value, right? In other words, melt value in silver was like 20 bucks. But the FBI came in and said, no, no, there's a counterfeit because you're saying it's $1, but, but it's not. So, you know, that would make him the worst counterfeiter in the yeah. history of the world. But, but anyway, I saw that kind of, you know, where that was just such a BS prosecution. I thought, okay, there's no way they're going to allow Bitcoin. And I have been completely shocked at their incompetence. Uh, I thought they would, uh, you know, go after and, you know, do a... Uh, trying to figure out who Satoshi is, this shadowy super coder who could undermine the entire world economy. Uh, but they haven't. They did not get their butts in gear, thankfully. But were you a gold bug first then? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and what is your position now? Bitcoin and gold? 
So I think the only, uh, on a fundamental level, I think Bitcoin is definitely better than gold. Uh, it has a couple of advantages. You know, number one, it is completely independent of the state. Right? The problem with gold is that it's physical. And this is usually why gold bugs say it's so super, because, because it's physical, because that constrains supply. The problem with being physical is that you have to store it somewhere. Right? And once you're storing it somewhere, um, you know, gold's valuable. And so you've got to put walls around it and alligators and laser beams on their heads. And that means that the government is going to know where the gold is. Right? It is impossible to store large amounts of gold and not have the government know where it is. And that means that the government can visit you. And um, so, you know, government necessarily, or gold necessarily becomes controlled by governments. And I think that's, you know, the answer. One of the challenges of being gold bug is that. Fiat boys, um, they ask, well, if gold is so amazing, then how come there's no countries in the world using gold, right? Like, you know, why has fiat won the, the market uh, competition? You say, no, violence won the market competition, <laughs> so um, government seized gold. And so Bitcoin surmounts that fundamental problem, right? You, you cannot uh, seize um, uh, private wallets. And then, of course, meanwhile, you know, gold has a it's not particularly useful in the modern economy right like how many transactions do you engage in where paper from hand to hand could be involved in at almost zero right almost every dollar that you transact certainly if you're a business just about every dollar you trans or every um, bit of money you transact uh, is electronic and so you know i think gold has uh, two fundamental flaws at the same time if the question is you know, if fiat collapses, what are people going to turn to? And I think that's a question of timeline simply because Bitcoin, more and more people are learning about it, but it, it's still probably 10 or 20 years before uh, grandma, you know, uh, feels comfortable using Bitcoin. So like if the system collapsed next year that I imagine, which it won't, but anyway, uh, I imagine that people would go to gold. And certain percent would go to um, Bitcoin, but gold would sort of be the standard money. And then gradually, just as today, more and more people would be learning about Bitcoin. Uh, and then I think that over time, people would shift from gold to Bitcoin. On the other hand, if the system is not going to collapse for 20 or 30 years, then I think at that point, enough people know about Bitcoin that we just skip gold. We just go directly to Bitcoin, which I do think um, is a superior form of gold. And you know, I one of the big questions I think in Bitcoin is the technical, uh, like you know, how do we teach more people about it? And I I don't think that's necessarily a part of it. I think honestly, it's just more about time. Like if Bitcoin's been around long enough, then people accept it. And I think a good metaphor there is credit cards, right? So like Grandma uses credit cards. Ask Grandma how a credit card works, right? Mm -hmm. No idea. So people don't understand fiat, and 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 in fact, fiat money with the central banks and the fractional reserve and the and the rehypothecate, it is far more complex than Bitcoin. You know, so there, there's this kind of meme in Bitcoin that you know, oh, it's tricky. How are we ever going to get get people to understand it? People don't understand fiat, right? They accept it because they see other people doing it, and you know, they don't lose all their money. Like they used a credit card and it worked, and okay. Um, so, uh, you know, I don't even necessarily think that we need to educate that much. I think it's it's kind of just automatic. Like as time goes on and people get used to the idea that um, there's this Bitcoin, you know, the price probably stops fluctuating so much as more people come in. You just get a sort of thicker market. Uh, and so, you know, even if we don't do anything whatsoever, if Bitcoin just kind of trundles along little by little, picking up new people then I think that um, eventually Bitcoin is going to take over one way or the other. Why do you think there's still a large number of uh, people who are Austrian economists that still don't get Bitcoin? I know. Someone I like think, a Tom Wood. Yeah, Tom, I know. Tom, Tom Wood, I, I love his podcast. Yeah. I think it's great. And he will cover Bitcoin. He'll have safety. And right. I don't think I've been on. He, he, yeah. he will have people on to talk about it. But it isn't central to him. Right. And it feels like it is the solution to a lot of the things he talks about. Yeah, I, I and you know Peter Schiff has sort of a more concentrated version. Yeah, uh, almost everything he says I love, but Bitcoin. Him, he's clearly a Bitcoiner. Peter Schiff. Yeah, really, no, without saying it. Like, no, he is a Bitcoiner, but he doesn't know it. Yeah, 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 absolutely, exactly, right. And you know, I think that a lot of it is just age. Um, you know, I it's the boomers. 
I, I think, frankly, it is. Um, I wrote the first pro Bitcoin article uh, at Mises Institute, and back then, you know, everybody in the Austrian community was hostile to Bitcoin, right? And in fact, when I first wrote it, this was uh, Jeff Deist, who was the president at yeah. the time, and all credit to him. So I, I wanted to write this pro Bitcoin thing, and he was like, "That's going to be a lift," because he knew there was going to be pushback and you know the rest of the board in this. And he was like, "Okay, can you just?" He maybe changed it to cryptocurrencies because I know because he didn't want it to look too self-interested as if we were like pushing for like one single one. But it was, I mean, the whole thing is about Bitcoin. But there's an argument against that. It's, it's if you want to write a, uh, something about gold and he pushes, he said, well, you got to write about silver, copper and everything else. This was like 2013 or 2014. So it, it wasn't as politicized yet. So we sharpened our knives now then. The knives are a heck of a lot sharper today. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I didn't push back because like yeah. it, it, it wasn't really a thing back then. Now, of course, it is a thing. Um, but anyway, so, uh, but that was like the first pro Bitcoin and throughout the article, you know, I'm saying Bitcoin, this, that, and essentially the argument in it is that the usefulness of a money does not come from whether it is backed by something physical. The usefulness of a money comes from what you can do with it. And so that's a very marketing centric perspective, right? Like what's the value of a pen? It is not the plastic, it's what it allows you to do, right? So it's feature first. So the, the value for anything derives from the feature. Of course, it's core to Austrian economics, right? The uh, subjective value. Um, and I think that that's also true for Bitcoin. And, and in fact, you know, I was arguing in that article is that if you're an Austrian economist, then you must evaluate money based on subjective. In other words, what, what can you do with it? Right, so you can transmit over distance, quasi anonymously at that time at very low fees, and you know this is uh, you know it has sovereign resistance. You have um, controlled supply, and so all of these things are extremely useful. And the argument, you know, essentially uh, is still true today. And I still think that you know the sort of true Austrian money uh, is Bitcoin for those reasons. It's it's a superior version of gold, but indeed. You know, you've, I think, tried to orange peel a lot of older people who should be Bitcoiners but are not yet. And honestly, you know, there's an expression that uh, science progresses funeral by funeral and not to get too maudlin, but frankly, <laughs> if they change their minds, then that's wonderful, but I'm, I'm not expecting too much. Do, do you have any doubts, any particular areas of Bitcoin that you have criticism for, doubts around, concerns? I think it's perfect. I think it's fantastic. I, you know, there's the question of usefulness for transactions and whether Lightning Network is all that it could be. And I, you know, there are various flaws in there. And I do hope that people will keep working on things like Lightning Network and that maybe we'll even replace it with something better. Uh, it would be really nice to have some way to transmit it um, that didn't have, <laughs> that was more perfect. Um, but I mean, even you know, just just um, layer one. You know, if it, if if Bitcoin's fate is to be, you know, sort of a uh, clearance type currency uh, as digital gold, then I still think that that is the vast majority of the value in it. You know, throughout history, there have been a lot of periods where you've had bimetallism, where you had gold for for the kind of underpinnings of the whole system, and then you had silver the, or copper that people were transacting day to day. If Bitcoin is that base layer. And then people are running around flipping tokens. Uh, when I say tokens, I mean like fiat currency or something. Uh, I think that's relatively harmless. Um, you know, oh, so you could have fiat backed by Bitcoin? Uh, and not, no, I mean, I think they would be completely separate. You know, so today, for example, uh, ca casino chips are a little tricky, but um, in various contexts, uh, well, like prisons or you know candy in Brazil, given as change, there are various contexts where people can use really low value tokens for basically trivial transactions, and there you know you can achieve that for small areas um, just by you know controlling the supply and demand. So, in, in other words, what I'm getting at is that you know sort of the the fundamental way that I think money transforms the world is that base layer. And there, I'm not too worried about transaction fees and things like that. I think that Bitcoin can do that. And then you, you could have some sort of um, layer on top of that, some sort of transaction layer that's using something else that, you know, it could be fiat, it could be uh, copper coins or something um, that is asset-backed. I think that 
the value in that sort of transaction layer is actually quite a bit lower. So that could be different things. Um, most likely, it would just be some representation of Bitcoin, maybe through an intermediary. You know, so they would be trading Sats, and you would have some. You would have to trust that intermediary, but those would be for relatively small amounts, and then for the large amounts, those would all be on the base layer. But I think that there is room for innovation on those sort of um, transmission tokens. But for me personally, in a way, that's also not very interesting. Like that, that isn't sort of the fundamental moving parts of the economy, where that base layer. You know, if we go back to bimetallism, what was always represented by gold, that gold. I think that function uh, can only be Bitcoin. And in terms of Bitcoin continuing to grow, uh, if we move towards a hyper Bitcoinized world, what what are the implications of that? You're most excited about? Do you see? You know, is it en- ending central banking? Is it yeah, redu- like naturally reducing size of government, or is it everything? Yeah, I think those are probably the two biggest. Um, it makes me. You know, on the one hand, I hate talking about government. Mm-hmm. I honestly do. I despise government. I would love to never talk about government, and I sort of resent that I have to talk about it. You know, so like to say that the most beautiful thing about Bitcoin is that it shrinks government. It it sort of feels like you're vandalizing a beautiful work of art. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like government is not good enough for Bitcoin. Um, but unfortunately, that's the world we live in. And you know, I do think that by displacing central banks, uh, by therefore cutting off. You know, one of the main channels that governments use to seize the people's resources. I think that you get a massive shrinkage of government that then leads to, I think, a whole lot of uh, social benefits. I think, you know, they have less control over education, uh, less over uh, quote unquote science. Uh, there are just a number of fields that I think improve. So I think that that is the single biggest difference. I know that there are people who talk about the um, implications for time preferences, for example. Uh, and like Saifedean, and honestly, I think that a lot of those effects probably have more to do with just government shrinking. You know, if we look at, for example, the travesty of, of buildings in <laughs> cities today compared to what governments used to build and what they build now, I think that really has a lot more to do with just government being independent of the people, no longer feeling like they actually have a client who they have to satisfy. You know, like in the old days, they had to make beautiful buildings because otherwise the people would say, what is this crap? And, you know, they would get in trouble. But now, what do they, what do they care about trouble? <laughs> well, I mean, it's it's great to talk to you. Um, uh, you're a proper Bitcoiner, which is great. Uh, I love it. Did you enjoy the conference? Yeah, yeah, I loved it. Yeah, there are tons of people there. We It was smaller than the last year, but yeah. in a sense, we got kind of like the true believers. So. I'm I'm happy either way. I love seeing more people getting on the lifeboat, but on the other hand, I also in the Bitcoin winters is when you know you kind of catch up with all the old friends, and so I'm I'm very happy with the community either way. Yeah, I I much preferred it from last year. I had to walk a lot less, which was great. Um, <laughs> I I want them to be successful though, so I want them to have uh, big events, and I'm looking forward to going to to it in Nashville next year with the banks. Well, we've obviously had a few collapse recently. <laughs> Um, and it feels like the entire sector is on the verge of collapse. That different dominoes falling at different points, and I know they won't, and they'll be bailed out, and the smaller ones will be gobbled up by the bigger ones. I know, I know that will happen, but but why is this happening? Fundamentally, the banking system is structured in a way that it it, it is unsustainable, right? So it it's built on fractional reserve. Fraction reserve means that you put your dollar in the bank, the bank essentially Xeroxes it, puts a picture of it there and says, yes, your dollar is right here anytime you want it. And then it goes off and lends that, right? It could lend that to uh, some tech bro, it could lend it to Argentina. Um, that, that money's off doing crazy things. And normally, you know, if the bank were completely upfront about this, like if the bank sat you down and explained and, and gave you like a little quiz and said, okay, you, you, you understand your money's not really here, right? Yeah, and uh, you know, um, of course, the easy way to do that is just to do something called a time deposit, like a CD, where the bank says, "Okay, well, put your money here. You can't have it for three months because we're going to go lend it out somewhere." Okay, and that's keeping the relationship straightforward. But the way that all banking really worldwide works is that the bank gets to do that fractional reserve thing instead, where it pretends that the money is there, it's available for you anytime you want, but actually the money is not. The money's somewhere else. And so once you allow that kind of system. You necessarily are going to need 
some kind of government organ or some kind of organization to bail out the banks to get in trouble because they 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 are claiming something that is not true, right? It, it's hmm. like institutional permanent fraud. And the customer has been told one thing, but the truth is something else. And so this has been a problem throughout history that banks have wanted to engage in that fractional reserve. And, you know, traditionally, because they know that once you start fractional reserve, you're going to start having banks fail because it's inherently fraudulent. They try to get sort of uh, cartels like um, groups of banks to get together to agree to bail each other out. So the most recent uh, event of this in the U.S., for example, was the Panic of 1907. The banks got in trouble; they started collapsing, and so J.P. Morgan came around and he basically passed the hat and he said, "Okay, okay everybody, put in. And anybody who doesn't put in is not my friend anymore," which has di- had dire consequences in 1907. Uh, and then, of course, after the that crisis passed, they got together and had the novel idea that perhaps they would prefer taxpayers do this instead. So that rather than having to bail each other out for this permanent fraud, they would have taxpayers do it. And so that brings us to the system we have today, right? which is where it, it is permanently bankrupt. It is by design bankrupt because it's fractional reserve. It's, pre- it's pretending your dollars in two places at once. And so you must have the central bank at that point to sustain that kind of what I would call fraud. So, you know, we are basically going through yet one more episode of again and again, you know, this happened, what, 15 years ago in both of our countries, it's going to happen again, it's going to happen permanently until we put a stop to it. And you could actually put a stop to it, right? You could simply tell banks, look, if you have a demand deposit, meaning that, you know, if you promise somebody that their money is there anytime they want, then you actually have to have the money there anytime they want. Right. And, you know, in practice, about 20% of bank deposits, you know, if we go back through history, they are checking accounts. So people would save about 20% of their dollars in the bank and they would expect to come in and get that anytime and that money would be in the vault. So it would look just like grandma thinks banks work, right? It would have actual money in the vault. And then the rest of it, they would get like a four or 5% interest rate from the bank to put it in the CD. And then the bank could go run around Argentina or whatever with that money. That would not be an inherently bankrupt system. And that would not, it would not collapse. It would not need central banking. So, but of course, you know, it is extraordinarily profitable for banks to be able to pretend to have $2 in the same place at once, right? Because they can lend one out, uh, even as they have to pay almost no interest on the other. So that system is not going to change. But what it means is that, you know, these built-in bank crises, they, they're, they're part of the system. Uh, This isn't a question of one bank screwed up or some regulator screwed up. They are going to be there forever. And at this point, they're going to keep increasing because the uh, federal, basically central banks and governments have been so reckless that they have created this, this wave of money that the only way to stop that was to put these incredible stresses on banks through interest rates that is going to continue crushing banks. If we look back through history, it's probably going to crush quite a few more. And you know, we've already seen shockwaves going into Switzerland and places like that. I think next we are going to start to see uh, other banks in you know, Europe, possibly UK, possibly in Asia. So I think we are just at the beginning of that crisis. Gosh. All right, well, at least we have Bitcoin. Um, <laughs> Tell me where to find you. Uh, I do daily videos. at. Uh, you can find me on Twitter. Pretty much everybody's on Twitter nowadays. And then I've also got a Substack. And, uh, oh, and I've got a podcast. That's right. I just round up the weekly videos. It is nowhere near as good as what Bitcoin did. But anyway, uh, if you don't want to track down the daily videos, find them over there. We will put that all in the show notes. This was everything that Danny promised. <laughs> Did you want to ask anything? No, I think we covered it. Thank you so much. Uh, ho- hopefully, we can do this again. Do, is it public where you're based? Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm in I'm in Orlando, so just okay, up the road. So, so not far yeah, from I'd it. love to do it. Yeah. yeah, I'd definitely like to do this again. I think uh, I think we should do it with Ben. That'd Get be great. Ben on a trip. Have Ben on the show. I think he would love that. Fantastic, Peter. Great to see you. It was great to see you, Peter.